This podcast is brought to you by Percussion Play, the world leading designer and manufacturer of outdoor musical instruments. Percussion Play's instruments are designed for all ages and abilities, bringing the joy of playing percussion to the great outdoors. Percussion Play is committed to making musical expression accessible to everyone, everywhere. What do you think of when picturing a library? Books? People studying, perhaps? Do you see people playing music and making noise? Music isn't typically associated with libraries, but here at Percussion Play, we're seeing more and more libraries embrace music in different formats. We checked out Hubbard Public Library in Ohio, in the United States, and found out how the library has diversified in many ways, including music. My name is Lorena Hagedis, and I am the director of Hubbard Public Library. So Hubbard Public Library is a library that is very, very woven into the heart of this community. So we are a fairly rural community. do have a little town here, but fairly rural. Hubbard Public Library has diversified its resources and even the way we reach our patrons. We still have all of the traditional collection, books, DVDs, things like that. But starting several years ago with a vision of my children's librarian, we opened up a toy lending library. So that means all of the the pieces of that collection are basically toys, but they're educational toys. So that opened during the pandemic, actually, and was a huge resource to families while their kids were homeschooling and um, virtual schooling and so forth. They had some extra activities to supplement or just entertain (laughs) their children and families. Beyond the library walls, pieces of our expanding collection are our outdoor activities. And the Story Walk is a huge piece of that. The Story Walk has a dozen posts where pieces of a book are posted. So along with the story, as families, children, individuals walk through the story walk, they're reading a story and they're also engaged in additional activities that they can do along the walk. And in that story walk, we have interspersed the sunflower pedal drums from percussion play (laughs) that are used and just lovely to hear. Story walk is actually a trademarked name and was formulated by someone that we have just patterned after and uh, used those, the story posts and everything. So during the pandemic, and I would say as much as the pandemic had negative aspects to it, there were some positives that uh, caused us to be creative thinkers. And how can we still provide library services that keep people safe, engaged outdoors? Um, So that kind of accelerated our outdoor plans. Sensory aspects are another piece of the vision and ways of engaging our patrons. We do have some people that need additional sensory impact or um, engagement. And the story walk is great, but the fact of sometimes whether it's touchy-feely things or auditory um, stimulation, things like that. So Everything that we have done, we have tried to pull in as many aspects of that sensory impact that we could. So it just made sense to find something auditory. And then in the research we've done, percussion play kept (laughs) coming up. And those sunflower pedal drums were just visually uh, attractive. And then again, the the look of the sunflower pedal drums, as well as just how they're used just seemed to be the most um, applicable to what we needed. We are very fortunate that the folks that come into our library are all generations. So we see a lot of that family aspect. We see a lot of um, multi-generational family aspects. We see individuals. We see uh, just two days ago, in fact, I was downstairs, glanced out across and looked at the garden and there was a fellow there probably 45 years old just by himself, you know, no, no kiddos or whatever. So it, it is attractive that the pedal drums by virtue of just their brightness 
people pull into the library the way our entrance drive is, you can see that first thing. And that alone, just like, oh, what's down there? <laughs> you know, people want to see it. So yes, it does attract all ages, all generations. So how else are libraries diversifying? In the United States, there's a variety of organizations which aim to support libraries to better serve their communities. One such organization is Let's Move in Libraries, which focuses on supporting healthy living in public libraries. I spoke with its founder, Noah Lenstra, an associate professor in the Library and Information Science program at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. I think kind of the, the incorporation of music has really taken off the most um, in kind of uh, what we call kind of pre-K programming or programming focused on getting ready to read. And, and a core component of that um, is not just kind of being able to sit down with a book and turn the page up and understand the words on the page, but really uh, having that whole child development. Um, and music um, from the beginning has been an intrinsic part of that. If you go to any any public library in America for the last uh, 10 to 15 years, um, if you go to a program for a pre-K audience, you're going to see a lot of music, uh, both listening to music, making music, uh, clapping, rhyming, uh, sometimes maracas. Um, and from there, it's, it's just expanded. They're like, oh, these kids are having a great time making music. Let's have a, a drum circle for adults. Um, let's do a uh, cardio drumming, um, let's do ukuleles. From there, it's really kind of just taken off and gone in a lot of different directions. Uh, some libraries have um, used their outdoor spaces for many years, uh, things like teaching gardens, pollinator gardens, uh, to teach about the environment, um, story walks. But during during the COVID-19 pandemic, there absolutely was uh, a, a realization that if we want to keep uh, engaging our communities, uh, we, we have to really use outdoor spaces. And that was especially so during summer of 2020. And in the wake of that, um, Kathleen Campana of Kent State and I, we did a national survey in 2022, really looking at how public libraries coming out of the pandemic were, were transforming their outdoor spaces. Um, and we found that uh, around 10% uh, of our sample uh, were engaged uh, in permanent transformations of their outdoor spaces to make them more functional in the programming space. So not just uh, a space that you happen to walk through <laughs> to get into the library, but a fully fledged uh, part of the library service, um, whether it be creating a, a patio with an awning uh, so that you can go and do outdoor programming, whether it be something like percussion play, musical instruments, whether it be garden, for that, I see it really is just kind of uh, percussion play. I see it's just part of the, the broader trend of thinking about uh, how, how can we use our outdoor spaces in a more strategic way to promote learning and engagement. So Story Walk um, uh, is an initiative can be can be traced uh, to a specific moment in time and place. So in 2007, um, a woman called Ann Ferguson, um, who had recently retired from the Vermont Department of Public Health as a chronic disease specialist, um, was thinking about what are some creative ways that we can prevent disease by getting families up and moving together. Um, uh, and also engaging in literacy. So she worked with uh, with the local public library in Montpelier, Vermont, um, uh, and really came up with this concept of kind of deconstructing uh, a children's storybook um, and posting the pages along a walking trail. Um, so it started in 2007, um, expanded slowly, first in the New England part of the United States, then around uh, 2010, 2011, started to get national attention. And then throughout the, the 2010s, kind of started percolating up and becoming more common. Um, and again, uh, 2020 uh, was like a lightning bolt to this trend. Um, so so I, I actually did a, a study looking at kind of the, the amplification of the story walk moment between um, March 2020 and March 2021, um, and we found a five-fold um, increase uh, in, in interest. Um, so it's one of these things where in the wake of the pandemic, this is a, a perfect example of kind of public libraries thinking more strategically about how they can use their outdoor spaces. Um, pollinator gardens are really part of a broader trend of gardens, period. So we have not just pollinator gardens, we have gardens and libraries that are growing food. So um, I, I think, again, uh, that, that trend really, really speaks to uh, understanding the environment, understanding ecology, but also understanding where our food comes from and, and how humans are, are kind of completely interwoven with the broader environment. Noah talked there about pollinator gardens. To learn more about what these are, I sat down with Percussion Play's library champion. 
I'm here with Daniel Fry Maguire from Percussion Play. He is their sales and marketing assistant and he's also their library champion. Daniel, um, can you tell me a bit about pollinator gardens and what you're seeing when speaking to libraries at the moment, that there's a trend towards them installing more pollinator gardens? Yeah, so um, in the last year, we've sort of seen a shift of, uh, sort of project focus from story walks across to pollinator gardens, um, creating these spaces, um, connecting children with like the outdoor world. But we are noticing more and more are creating these interactive elements, so bringing in a bit of music, um, adding to another century of experience. So these pollinator gardens have flowers and plants that obviously bees and nature need, um, but they're including the musical instruments within these gardens. Yes, yeah, so they're creating sort of musical elements um, within these gardens, adding a bit of life to the garden, a bit more interactivity. Uh, it's something for the whole family to be able to enjoy. Um, it also sort of draws um, customers to the libraries. And what type of instruments are they including? We've noticed a trend with uh, our botanically inspired range. So we've got uh, things like our Liberty Bells, uh, inspired by mushrooms. Uh, you've got things like the cattails, the harmony flowers. Um, those are really striking pieces and they fit really well within these sort of botanically inspired gardens. To dig a little deeper into the diversification of libraries, we spoke to the president of the American Library Association, who was attending the association's annual conference in San Diego. The conference is where librarians come together to share knowledge and be inspired by initiatives and programmes being developed. My name is Emily Drabinski. I'm associate professor at the Queens College Graduate School of Library and Information Studies, and I am president of the American Library Association. Over the course of the year, I've seen many outdoor programs in many public libraries all over the United States. Story walks, pollinator gardens. I was in New Lebanon, New Hampshire, and saw the public library there circulates garden beds. You can check out a garden bed mm -hmm. for the uh, growing season. And I think it's such a good way to get people from all walks of life, from all parts of your community together, doing things together mm -hmm. outside, whether that be gardening uh, or taking a walk to read a story, uh, learning about gardens and other kinds of uh, outdoor elements. If we think of libraries as engines of social engagement uh, and engagement uh, with people and place, Moving those programs outside is a natural extension of what we do. I see a lot of libraries including music and crafts and other kinds of art into their programming. I think it's a, it's a good way for libraries to connect. Uh, I think it's an opportunity for us to connect to patrons outside of the normal reader base. The ALA put out a report this year about the use of libraries by Gen Z uh, and millennial patrons. And what was interesting in that report was not only that those populations use the library in great numbers, but they often use it even when they don't describe themselves as readers. And so for those who think of the library as traditionally just a place for books and people who love to read, and it certainly is that, there's so much else happening at the local library uh, and including things that people enjoy together, enjoy uh, individually, enjoy as parts of families. Mm -hmm. That's a really, um, we're always looking for ways to connect to those communities and music is one of those ways. I mean, I think the future of libraries depends a lot on what we want that future to be. It can be easy to get uh, a little down, right, about what we see in the library ecosystem. Here in the United States, we are grappling with an organized censorship movement, just like libraries in the UK, we're dealing with funding issues and an attempt to deprofessionalize the field and a reduction in force in terms of staffing. And all of those are huge issues that get in the way of us making good on our mission, which is to connect people to resources, to connect people to people, to connect people to community institutions. So the future, which I think all of us want, is one where libraries engage the broadest possible sector of the community, where the library has something for everyone, and that everyone feels that they belong in the library and that the library belongs to them. If that's what we're after, and I think it is, we'll see uh, more kinds of outreach and programming uh, in the ways that we've been describing here in terms of outdoor engagement, music and art, crafts, all the things that people other than readers do, but we also need to take seriously the, the political questions of what kind of support do we get from our 
governments for the work that we do on behalf of our communities. And that's the piece that I think we need to be organizing around and making sure that we are resourcing libraries in such a way that they can expand their programming into the kinds of projects that you and I might want to see in our communities. Many libraries use their outside space for music, but we're seeing some install instruments inside. Wherever they go, their impact is clear. Musical instruments and libraries are changing how libraries engage with their local communities. It is helping libraries to appeal to a wider set of patrons, which in turn is giving more people the opportunity to discover that their local library isn't just a place for books. We'll finish with Lorena, who reflects on the impact music making has had at Hubbock Public Library. It's really cool because even if folks don't want to be engaged with the story itself and reading, or maybe they get halfway through and they get a little distracted or whatever because the pedal drums are basically halfway through <laughs> through the story, um, those pedal drums are there and you just see people really enjoying themselves and, and experimenting, which part of our mission of the library is to engage people with expanding their creativity, all of those types of aspects, not just sitting and reading. So anything that we can put somewhere in the library or on the grounds that allows people to see the library in a different light and engage in different ways besides just reading, it's, it's really nice. For more on how libraries are embracing music, head to www.percussionplay.com and check out our white papers.